everybody. Welcome to another edition of the Lab 207 webcast. My name is Mr. Kite, and I'll be hanging out with you today as we continue on in our series about the living world. Topic for the day is going to be synapses. So let me go ahead and get you your objectives. In an effort to keep this short, we'll get going. So two things you need to know or be able to do by the end of this video. First up, describe signaling across a synaptic cleft. And second, understand the consequences of signal transmission across the synaptic cleft. Lots of words. Um, over the last couple of days, we have been talking about nerve signaling. And in the last video, we talked about action potentials, which was essentially that electrical signal that runs down the axon of a neuron. The thing is, in order for neurons to actually be able to communicate with other neurons or cells in the body, that electrical signal has to be changed into a chemical signal because for the most part, neurons don't send electrical signals between each other. That electrical signal leads to the release of a chemical signal. Now, the synaptic cleft is the place that the axon of one uh, neuron meets up with the cells that it's targeting or another um, neuron itself. And where those places, where those two cells meet up, there's a small gap in between called the synaptic cleft. Um, if you look at our little diagram over here on the side, you can see that we have got a neuron coming down the line here. Here's another cell right there. See the axon hooked up right there with the other cell. Zoom in, you can see that there's a small gap right there, and that is the synaptic cleft. All signaling happens across that gap. Now, as far as the way that signaling actually happens, it goes down something like this. We talked about action potentials the other day. That is that electrical signal that is flying down the axon, causing it to depolarize and repolarize um, in a sequential manner. When that action potential hits the end of the line, at the end of the axon, at the synaptic cleft, what it does is it signals vesicles, and those vesicles have got neurotransmitters inside of them. Neurotransmitters are different chemicals that cause a response in another cell, whatever cell that they are targeting. So you've got your action potential, races down the line, it signals the formation of vesicles to those guys, and each of those vesicles has neurotransmitters inside. When the action potential hits the end of the axon, it tells those vesicles to fuse with the membrane. When they fuse with the membrane, they dump their neurotransmitters into the cleft. Those neurotransmitters then bind to special receptors on the membrane across the way. The membrane across the way is called the postsynaptic membrane. I'll talk about that in a second. But those neurotransmitters bind to that postsynaptic membrane and initiate some sort of response. Now, when they bind to the postsynaptic membrane, essentially what you get is either an excitatory response or an inhibitory response. Those neurotransmitters essentially, when they bind, cause a bunch of ligand-gated ion channels, big word right there, ligand-gated ion channels to open or close. Now you see ligand-gated, if you remember a ligand is something that binds specifically to a specific receptor. So a ligand ligand-gated ion channel would be an ion channel, a protein that lets ions through, that is gated in response to a ligand binding it. When the specific ligand, which in this case would be the neurotransmitter diffusing across that cleft, when the ligand binds to the uh, channel, it signals the gate to open up. When that gate opens up, there are channels for potassium ions, there are channels for sodium ions, there are channels for chloride ions. Either way, ions start moving into the cell that's across the way and that is going to either excite the cell so it's going to cause um, movement towards a state closer to the action potential so the um, polarization of the membrane is going to go down and move it closer towards action potential or it's going to inhibit which means that it would move the cell electrically further away from an action potential so from those channels opening or closing letting ions in or keeping ions out it's either going to cause the neuron to move towards being excited or away from being excited. And that poor cell body has got signals coming into it from all over the place. So one cell body could have hundreds of dendrites on it. Each of those dendrites are receiving signals that are either excitatory signals or inhibitory signals. Basically what happens to that cell body is it's receiving all these excitations and inhibitions and it kind of munges and processes that all together and based on the sum of all of that 
it either fires off an action potential or it holds back. So if most of the signals that it's receiving from all of its dendrites are pushing it towards excitation, then an axion, then the action potential will fire down its axon. If most of the signals that it's receiving are inhibitory, then it will not further send on the signal. So this really is like the integration central of the nervous system because it's having to process all of those signals that are coming in and ultimately send off a signal or not send off a signal. And obviously, you got to shut it down because if your signals were con if your uh, cells were continually sending signals your body wouldn't be able to function or communicate efficiently. So what happens is all those neurotransmitters that are released into the synaptic cleft, as long as they're in that cleft, they will keep signaling whatever ligand-gated channel they bind to. So when the signal needs to shut down, um, enzymes are released into that cleft and they break down the neurotransmitters, thus cleaning them out of the area. Once those neurotransmitters are cleaned out of the area, then the cells are ready to signal again across that synaptic cleft. So just recognize that you have got to clean out those neurotransmitters so that they aren't continually stimulating the postsynaptic membrane on the other side of the cleft. And here's what I want to wrap up. Um, neurotransmitters can be broken down into five different categories. And my bet is that you're not going to have to memorize all of these. But I just kind of wanted to show you that, hey, there are five major classes of neurotransmitters. And there are hundreds and hundreds of neurotransmitters, but they can all be grouped up according to this kind of scheme right here. So I just wanted to get them into your head. Um, there's one group of neurotransmitters known as acetylcholines. And these guys are central to nervous system function. They are active in learning and memory and muscle stimulation and all kinds of stuff. So they're a big deal. That's one class. You've got amino acids, which are just single amino acids. Remember, amino acids are hooked together to make proteins. Um, there are single amino acids that act as neurotransmitters in the central nervous system and the peripheral nervous system. Nervous systems, we'll talk about them in a couple videos. There are biogenic amines, which is going to be a nitrogen-containing amino acid. Some examples of these guys are epinephrine, which we have talked about a little bit when we're talking about the endocrine system. There's dopamine and serotonin, which are responsible for mood control. Control. Um, you got neuropeptides, which is going to be, you see peptide right there, which means it's probably going to be some sort of protein. Um, neuropeptides are involved in pain, so actually feeling pain, and on the opposite end, um, they are also endorphins, and endorphins actually dull the pain. So these neuropeptides are involved in feeling pain and actually dulling pain. Then finally, you've got some gases. Gases act like local regulators. Obviously, if a gas is released at the synaptic cleft, you can't have an enzyme come in and clean out all the little um, neuro uh, neurotransmitter particles. So these just work on the cells in the immediate area. One example of a gas would be nitrous oxide, and that is involved in some dilation responses in the body. So that's it. That is signaling at the synapse, um, helping one cell to talk to the other. Thank you for joining us on the Lab 207 webcast. My name is Mr. Kite, and we'll see you again.